Milton Lawson, it's good to see you, my friend. Good to see you. Thanks for having me back. Oh, it's my pleasure. And um, uh, this is obviously the SOFIA program. Uh, I'm Dan Kaufman, the host. Uh, I have a, I'm a professor of philosophy at Missouri State University. I um, also publish an online magazine called The Electric Agora. I'm very glad to be here once again with Milton Lawson, who has so many job descriptions that I'm just going to let him tell them again <laughs> um, because I don't want to get them wrong. So just give us your little brief uh, who you are and what you do. Uh, Milton Lawson, comic book writer based in Houston, Texas, uh, lifelong nerd and geek, the kind of guy who is, yes, wearing a Star Wars shirt to a conversation about Star Trek. Uh, so I'm, I'm, that, I'm that kind of geek. Um, but also I'm a, a former video editor from Blogging Heads TV. Um, so um, I've got a history with the, the format here and the sister channels of Blogging Heads. And are you, is it, your, your aim is to, is to become a full-time creator of comics. Is that your, yes, that yes. That is your aim, um, right? Yeah, I have, I have high ambitions. I've got uh, a couple of projects that I'm hoping to gain enough momentum towards that would be big franchises in and of themselves, knock on wood. But in order to get to that point, you need to establish a certain amount of audience credibility in the industry that I don't have yet. So, that's the goal. Yeah, yeah. Um, so as, as Milton mentioned, we're here today to talk about Star Trek. Um, but let me qualify and be a little more specific about what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the new Star Trek programs, and those are Star Trek Discovery, which has had two seasons, and there will be a third, um, and Star Trek Picard, of which there has been one season. I believe they're planning on having a second, but obviously all the stuff with the virus probably is going to delay everything, all production of everything. Um, um, And and, and I don't know whether its ratings were, were good enough to, to get it a second season, even if, even if uh, there wasn't the issue of the coronavirus. And I don't know, Milton, do you know anything about that? About whether the show did well enough that they are, that they would ordinarily do a second season? I believe that they had, they had committed to doing so and announced that there would be a second season. They have said that in general, the numbers uh, were the best in the history of their platform, but that, it's a pretty, you know, new platform. So who knows what that means? But um, I think critically it was not as well received as they would have hoped. So who knows? You know, just as an aside, um, and you, you're not quite as old as me, but you're, you're, you're getting there. Um, um, How are, look in my, in our day, the relevant ratings were the Nielsen ratings on TV shows. How are how how are they measuring success of TV shows now? With given that they're on all these odd platforms and being delivered, often fragmented, right? I mean, you know, I'm watching CBS All Access, but I'm watching it through Amazon Prime. You know, right, um, right. do you have any idea how they're? What, what's the new Nielsen number? Well, the sad thing is, is there's no transparency in it, and we all have to. Those of us who pay attention to this stuff have to rely on, you know, secondary indicators. But the best reporting I've seen on this claims that the metric that the streaming platforms care about is they somehow are able to correlate specific shows with new subscribers. And they want, that's the number they want. Does this show give me X number of new subscribers? And the the mathematicians have apparently worked out also that the ideal sweet spot is for shows that only have two seasons. So we're probably going to have even briefer and briefer runs of shows, uh, which is kind of weird and counterintuitive to me because some of the, some of the biggest hits that we all think of have longer runs, but apparently that's the sweet spot that they're aiming for. Interesting. Do you have any idea why? Um, What the logic is from their perspective? No, I, I would question that metric to begin with. I think maybe their modeling is, you know, implicitly creating some bias towards a shorter number of seasons, but we don't really have any insight into where those numbers are coming from. So we just sort of have to take it on faith that they're, they're being honest in what they represent. But the point is that 
15 seasons of mash is never happening again. That, that, that's sort of the, <laughs> apparently. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or even seven seasons of star Trek next generation. Right. I mean, that's right. And um, from the creator's point of view, I've, I've heard that like seven seasons is the sweet number, like for actors, like once you get to a seventh season is when you really bank tons of money personally. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's kind of a number that those people aim for. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this may be relevant to something we talk about towards the end. So yeah. we, we want to talk about the new Star Treks and I want to talk about them in two ways. I want to talk about them on their own merits as programs. And then I want to talk about them in the context of the Star Trek franchise. And then I would like to talk more broadly a little bit about franchises, specifically franchises that belong to sort of, you know, what has traditionally been sort of uh, nerd and geek culture. Mm -hmm. Um, And sort of what the dynamics are in terms of growth moving forward, trying to attract new fans while at the same time, you know, keeping the, the hardcore base. Um, so that's, I, those three things are the things I'd like to talk about roughly in that, in that order. Um, um, if that is okay with you. Um, Sounds great. So <laughs> let's start with, um, we can do either one. We can do it in whatever order you want, or if you want to just talk to them together um, on their own merits as programs, what did you think of Star Trek discovery? What do you, what do you think of it so far? And what do you think of Picard so far? Well, it's interesting because my one-line review of Star Trek Discovery kind of implies the second half of the discussion you want to make, and that on its own, isolated, I quite enjoyed Star Trek Discovery just as a as a pure uh, escapist sci-fi entertainment program, and I would loved a number of the bold choices they made in terms of resetting their own status quo multiple times within a given season. And mm-hmm. I thought that they covered a lot of plot development in the two seasons of that show that they've already exhausted a number of avenues that would have taken other shows six or seven seasons to get to. So I was impressed by Let that. me interject. Obviously, I didn't say this at the beginning. This will be full of spoilers. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> massive spoiler alert. I'll also have that written on the thing so that people don't get furious <laughs> at us. We are going to spoil everything we talk about. Anyway, good, I'm sorry. Good. Go on. So you, you like the um, – you, you, as it, on its own merits, you thought Discovery um, was exciting. It was good television. It was – and it was – um. It sounds to me like you're saying a little bit um, unpredictable. In the sense that, do you know, was that yeah. was it planned that they were going to go through three captains in this show, or was that a, a, a serendipitous result of people quitting and stuff? Um, I, I, I don't have a theory on that. It may have been the latter. The, the production of the first season in particular was extremely tumultuous. Uh, it went through multiple showrunners. Yeah. And whether or not that translated, I don't think so because it seemed baked into the premise – begin with even the first episode uh, ends with a reset of its format. You think it's going in one yeah, direction yeah. And, and it goes in a completely yeah, other direction. Yeah, yeah. But the, the second half of my review is I don't think it's a Star Trek show. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I have a lot of sympathy for Star Trek fans, hardcore Trekkies that just fundamentally – don't get on board with discovery because it's antithetical to the key uh, values of what a Star Trek show should be about. Yeah. Now, now let, you know, actually on that front then let's on those two measures. What about Picard? Picard. I, I like on both measures, but it's kind of weird to say that on Picard because Picard was rather self-consciously trying to escape the trappings of a standard Star Trek episodic structure. They, they decided to not go with this, the, the structure of we've got a week by week mission. We're going to go to a new planet. We're going to be on the bridge of this ship. We're going to explore new worlds and then reset everything. When we get to the next episode, they rather, consciously w- decided to go against all of that. Yeah. Um, and yet I still found it very true because unlike discovery, which is kind of a new team and new people, Picard had a continuity in that it 
lovingly embraced the mythology of its central character. All of the central character's actions felt true to what we know of that character. And I just personally like um, occasionally stepping outside of the boundaries of a given structure and trying something different. So yeah. Yeah. That, that might just be more of a personal taste thing, but yeah. So let's, um, let's talk about the, you know, I, 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 I I'm going to save my own, my own thoughts on this till we get a little deeper into yours. Um, um, on the subject of the structure in both the cases of both discovery and Picard, they've consciously chosen the sort of the serialized model rather than the freestanding episode model. Right. In other words, and that's actually, you know, people, people who are, who are, you know, um, rending their garments over how that's not what Star Trek ever was. It's actually really not true. I mean, it's true that the original series was episodic. It's true that the next generation was episodic. Um, with a few two parters and, you know, um, but, both Deep Space Deep Space Nine and Enterprise had substantial portions of the program that were serialized, that were a little extended. So Enterprise, of course, had the entire season three was one story, and that was the Zindi the Zindi season, um, which I don't know. A lot of people have mixed feelings about. I thought it was the, one of the best things about the whole show. I thought that was some of the most original, most interesting, most nail biting material in the show where the stakes were really high and you felt it. Um, and Deep Space Nine had enormous arcs. I mean, arcs that would take up half seasons, um, 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 you know, easily, and multiple seasons were like that. So it's not really true that Star Trek's never done it. However, um, I, do, I am interested in what you think about the relative merits or demerits of those two models for this kind of television. Right. Well, I think that um, audiences in general are shifting away from the episodic format in all all genres, not just science fiction. I think that once Breaking once Bad, the, Sopranos, that whole model is now sort of yeah everywhere. Yeah, and I think this even predates the streaming platforms. Once the old school Netflix, where you could mail away and get DVDs sent back to you. Once, uh, once that format came into being and TV show seasons were put on DVDs, binging entire seasons, uh, became the, uh, the drug of choice for entertainment and shows like Lost and 24, they, they had their biggest, uh, engagement, not in their original broadcast at first, but once, uh, once people got a chance to experience it and binge it on home video. And I think that that's kind of an expectation that's built into most television nowadays. I agree that it's part of the reason they probably did it is because of the business model that they think the audience is expected. But I'm curious, you know, as a comic writer yourself and as a a person who, you know, who understands the aesthetics of this, what is your view of the relevant medics purely on the grounds of aesthetics of these two different rival kinds of formats in this kind of programming, because I, I actually don't know if I think it's really that well suited to this kind of programming. I, I, I think it's very well suited to something like breaking bad or the Sopranos, but I don't know if I think it works in programming, like the kind of programming that star Trek is supposed to be at, at very well, or at least not that it shouldn't always be like that. You know, the X files had a mixed model. I right. don't know if you remember. There were the yeah. freestanding episodes and then there were this basically there was basically the conspiracy alien arc that ran through the whole show. And that was sort of I thought kind of like a sweet spot um um for 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 that kind of television. Um and Star Trek was doing that in shows like Deep Space 9 it was a mixed bag. I guess part of my my thing that I don't that I think doesn't quite work about it is that the problem is is that you wind up having a lot of episodes that just feel like filler, right? Um, because, yeah. you know, if you're breaking all the interesting stuff up into little pieces and spreading it out all around with a few points where the tensions all sort of come together, it means you have a lot of space in between. That's kind of, that's kind of dead space. Um, and something like The Sopranos, it almost seems to me that the ensemble is so compelling 
that right. you would just wa- you just wouldn't mind just watching them hanging out in the backyard drinking, right? I mean, you know, but for shows like Star Trek, I just don't know if it's got that kind of you know, how do you feel about it aesthetically? Do you think it works in this me- in this genre or do you think the episodic is a better way of doing it in this genre? Aside from the business considerations, obviously. Right. I I think you, you raise really good examples with X Files, and I think the ideal, the platonic ideal, is actually trying to find that happy medium, especially with with a show like Star Trek. And I think Discovery does this better than Picard. Picard definitely felt like it it had a it was a novelistic approach and the the showrunner of it is is a novel writer so it definitely felt like chapters in a book yeah. sort of like the wire yeah um, more so than but discovery it felt like um it was just exhausting every idea it could and burn it out as fast as it could. And then three episodes later, they find themselves like, wow, we, we burned through that whole idea. We got to start a whole new status quo. The relationships and all these characters have, have suddenly changed yeah. in, you know, a three or four episode arc. And we're going to create a new three or four episode arc. Yeah. So structurally, I think discovery does a much better job of that balance. And uh, I don't ever felt, I never felt like Discovery had filler episodes, but it definitely had bad episodes. Yeah, and look, and that's not some, look. There's no show that that's not true of, right? Right, um, right. Um, um, and um, the so Office UK, but that's only six episodes. Other than what? <laughs> the Office UK, and oh yeah, that's, well, but that's six episodes that's, a season. That's <laughs> that's like a one in a thousand program. I mean, I mean, um, right. Um, <laughs> Programs made by mere mortals. Um, but um, but um, to the aesthetics of it, I I prefer to err on the side of the longer form story nowadays because it just feels a little bit false to me to be in a format that demands you week to week pretend like the previous week didn't happen and that everything should always come back to a... Um, consistent status quo where all the character relationships are all the same, all the power dynamics are all the same. And that's so that, you know, Bob in Minnesota and Fred in Florida can both come at, you know, episode seven and episode 15 equally and have an equal experience and not have any sort of issue. But is, that I like- necess- is that a necessary constraint? I mean, I think that the, the, that there was substantial character development, let's say in a show like Star Trek The Next Generation, and it was entirely episodic, but, you know, Riker by the end of the show was a totally different guy from Riker from the beginning. Um, yeah. Troy but, changed a lot. Um, 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 but it was very, very gradual. Very in gradual. Other, in other words, I don't know that episodic precludes you from being able to develop characters although it's probably a lot harder right it demands a lot more yes. skill it takes a lot more skill to do i wonder if part of the reason for the epi- the serialization aside for the business imperatives is that it's just a lot easier to do right it's much harder to hide to write balanced properly paced one hour self-contained that's a very hard thing to do i mean it's like writing a very short essay it's very difficult right it's much easier this, this to write um yeah um, um uh but I don't know but that I, I think that the character development is necessarily precluded by the episodic. Well, I think, well, a dimension of this is also the platform. Like there's a difference between broadcast network television in the day and these boutique yeah. side little streaming providers now. Um, you know, most of the character development we think of, or at least I think that most of the character development that we think of when we think of the classic original Star Trek crew didn't happen on the show. It happened in the movies after the show concluded. Like that's when a lot of the deep relationships and crisis points, um, occurred for that team. Hmm. And, um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I wonder, I wonder just how much it does. I mean, if, if let's, let's do a thought experiment. If CBS had decided that instead they were going to run Picard and just discovery on their main channel. Right. You think it still would have been serialized? You think it would have been episodic? I think it would have been more episodic. I think they still would have tried 
to have uh, some of the character development, but I think some of the choices would have been far less bold. Um, I think, uh, like, for example, deep into the run of Picard, we get to reunite with Riker and Troy, and they have this idyllic sort of existence that's also haunted by the death of uh, a young child. And I remember thinking that, okay, if this was on regular CBS, they, they wouldn't have had the dead child. He would have been the cute little kid in the corner, you know, drawing his crayon. They better made it easy. You're saying that, that, that they can go a little tougher. Yeah. Um, in these streaming platforms because they're not, it's, it's not, doesn't need, they don't need to take into consideration such a ubiquitous sort of audience, right? It's, it's, yeah. It's it's a very self selecting audience, yeah, yeah. And I think even the central conceit of Picard would have been a problem. Um, you know, we all love a lot of the best episodes in Star Trek are when the captain decides to defy, defy Starfleet in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, but it's but it's always like one episode, and in general, we we view Starfleet as this great moral guiding force with values that we all um, are on board with. And Picard wrestles with a scenario where Starfleet itself is somewhat of an antagonist. Yeah. And um, well, partly because it's been infiltrated. Its it's been infiltrated. I mean, um, right. um, um, the, 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 the head of that very secret Romulan organization is, is the head of Starfleet security. Right? Yeah. Well, we, <laughs> we don't know this until about 80, 90% into the show. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, that's right. And it, it, if it had been on, on episodic TV that, you know, uh, network TV, they may have needed 20 episodes a season as opposed to 10. Um, and you would have been 15 episodes into this, this show before you would have found that out. And I think, I think a number of audience members would have really groused about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me, let me just say a few things about, about the show, about, let, let me, I'm going to talk about discovery first. Um, and again, I'm not talking about it on its merits, not as a Star Trek show. So I'm going to save those 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 points until when we get to that. There are a number of things about it, though, that I thought represented just not very good television. And I don't know whether it's the, the, whether it's that it's the writing is bad or whether it's that um, there were certain ideological imperatives that they wanted to that they wanted to sort of ensure got across. But there were certain things about it that I thought um, were, were poor, and, and this, let me let me let me just give you a few of them, and I want to hear what your what your opinion is. Um, I think the weakest thing about Discovery is that its least interesting, least appealing character is its lead character. Um, I found everybody more interesting than Michael Burnham. I thought Michael Burnham was by far the least interesting character in the entire cast, and so I didn't want to see her as much as I did. Um, I also found the 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 adoration for her by the other cast members completely at odds with my perception of her. In other words, I found her very unlikable and unappealing. But everyone in the show acts like she's the messiah, right? I mean, like 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 she's the greatest thing in the universe. We are constantly told over and over again, explicitly. It's not even so how everything hinges on her and it's all about you and it's all and over and over and over again to the point to which I was actually kind of hoping they would kill her off um, 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 just because I thought it was so – I felt like I was being bashed over the head with Michael Burnham and I couldn't really figure out why. Um, I couldn't understand what it was that was so important to the showmakers to – have her be like 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 the 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 Superman of of Star Trek, right? I mean, to the point at which, by the end of the second season, she's actually flying in a superhero costume, right? I mean, I mean, it's just you know flying through space like 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 you know with a fleet behind her. I just found it completely unbelievable, over the top, um, and I felt like something was being shoved at me, and I didn't really understand why it was being shoved at me. I mean, so so that was. One real complaint is that I think the show lead is is the weakest character in the in the entire in the entire program, and I think that they're presenting her in a way that is I, I think at least bad writing, but maybe more than that, sort of bad conceptualization. I, I don't know what what is your opinion of the lead, and and if you like her, 
what 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 is your reaction to my reaction to her? It's funny you should mention that because um, I I have a small amount of sympathy with your perspective when it comes to one aspect of season two, but I'm going to set that aside for the moment because in general, I actually love the central. You like the character. Yeah. And the main reason I like the character is that one of my, one of my um, points of friction with Star Trek as a franchise generally is that um, although I, I'm very much on board with the Roddenberry vision of the future um, and the values of Starfleet and the values of uh, going through the frontier, valuing uh, diplomacy over violence, um, and the, the the common themes of all of the or most of the Star Trek shows, with yeah. one notable. Let's exception. call that the Roddenberry ethos, because it's going to the come Roddenberry up, ethos. It's going to come up later when we talk about these as Star Trek shows. So let's um, assume that as a shorthand. Anyway, go on. But um, aesthetically, there's a bit of an antiseptic mm. quality to even the shows that I love, the original series and the Next Generation, and they are very light on conflict between characters. And most of the characters are presented in a fairly morally Mm. pure uh, point of view. And the only amount of disagreement that's usually ever tolerated within the Star Trek show is, you know, character A wants to point the ship 37 degrees and character B is like, no, no, we need 41 degrees. And we will have a polite but stern argument over the merits of those, you know, seven degrees of difference or whatever. Um, whereas Michael Burnham in the very pilot episode, it's in a fight you know, with everybody. Yeah. 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 And, and, um, arguably, uh, causes the death of her most beloved, uh, personal relationship and becomes an anathema throughout the entire organization she's pledged her life to. So just the moral conflict at the center of that character is unprecedented in the world of Star Trek. And for that reason, I found her compelling in a sort of Don Draper, Tony Soprano, anti-hero sort of way. Let me so, stop you there for a minute. Um, um, just because I want to, I want to ask you and challenge you a little bit in my view what you were, what you, what you're describing that you really wanted that that discovery gave you, I think was already done more than adequately by Star Trek: Deep Space Nine. It had a I much. I confess, I'm. Oh, I'm you not haven't watched that show. Yes, Nine. I've tried several times. Oh, because that yeah, that's the show which is much darker. <laughs> That's the okay. show where there's a lot of conflict between the characters. That's okay. the show where Cisco does some seriously amoral things, including, okay. including he murders people. That there's a, there's an entire episode which is about him trying to trick the Romulans into the get into the war against the Dominion on the side of the Alliance, and the things he has to do. I mean, at, at the end of the episode, he just looks right at the camera, breaks the fourth wall, and said, "I lied. I stole. I killed." And I would do it again, right? Because okay, of how okay. overwhelming. In other words, in other words, they already did that, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and okay. Enterprise also had a lot of darkness in it, um, 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 especially in as you got to the later seasons. So, um, you know, is this just that you know? Well, you didn't watch enough of the Star Trek that was already kind of dark. I don't know if you watched all of Enterprise. Um, um, no, um, I am very light on DS9 and on Enterprise. Um, I made it through all of Voyager. I, I love the TOS and TNG. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I just I just felt DS9. Um, every time I've tried it, I've I've just found it really wanting. Well, then it's so. a, then it's a, not an apropos question because to <laughs> yeah. you, the 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 more dark, let's call it realism that you were looking for, you didn't you didn't see the the shows that did it more. So for for you, yes, Discovery yeah. would have been the first show to have done it. So fine, I'll, I'll drop that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But what about what about this more the the issue about Super Burnham? Yes. Now, Do you think that that's bad? Two, that's just bad characterization? In season two, there's kind of a bit of like chosen one quality to her. Um, I mean, she's literally like an angelic 
figure. And I, I found that aspect of the season really um, annoying, but there were a number of other juicy elements in season two that, that kept my interest. So I was able to kind of ignore that, even though that was a fairly prominent part. I mean, it, it literally is the spine of the entire season. Yeah. So I'm, I'm overlooking a pretty yeah. major part of it, but I thought, um, her relationship with Spock and in particular the performance of the actor who played Spock were just really compelling television. Um, so I enjoyed the second season, uh, but I definitely understand your, your perspective on the, the superhero yeah. Yeah. Uh, messianic aspect of her yeah. characterization. Yeah. And it's, and it's, you know, I didn't like, I don't like that. And I, to me, that to me is a failure, a, a creative fa- failure. Um, especially if it was done on purpose. Um, but what about the other aspect is that, and maybe this fits, falls under your thing about wanting it darker, about how, at least to me, she was extraordinarily unlikable. But to the characters in the show, she's like loved like more than anyone, and, and I can't understand why, right? In other words, did you not find her a, a, a sort of, sort of a, a not appealing person? She's very, very self-righteous and judgmental, and yet she, she, she's, she, she, she's one of the major fuck-ups in the show, right? In other words, you know what I'm saying? In other words, she, she's a classic sort of, in my view, you know, self-important, self-righteous type who is a hypocrite, right? Did you not find her unappealing, or did, is that what you liked about her, was that she... It's, it's funny, um, I... For the most of season one and good chunks of season two, I would have taken all of you, those adjectives you just applied and put them on the uh, ship's engineer character played by Anthony Rapp. I found him mostly uh, just really annoying and self-righteous okay. and hypocritical. Um, with Michael Burnham, I find her in the tradition of like Spock and Data, you know, since she was raised mm. by Vulcans – She's got that sort of... She's awkward, you saying, yeah. She's got that conflict of someone who is always at war with logic and emotion and trying to um, contain her the, the more human aspects of her. And so those qualities in her, I, I find compelling, but I, I, I can see how um, I, those kind of qualities are kind of gruffly endearing to me, whether or not if I was on the ship with her, I would also find them that way. Maybe not. So your, your critique of how the, the other characters respond to her, I, I, I see some merit in that. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting observation. It never occurred to me once to think of her in comparison with Data or Spock. But, of course, now that you're saying it, and I'm thinking, well, of course, this girl's and this woman's entire formative life was spent on Vulcan. Um, and how and, and 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 we are given quite a lot of that, so that it's that's not given short shrift. And so, I have to now. I have to, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to reevaluate now what I think because that's a very good observation. It's one that just hadn't I somehow hadn't put together. She's um, the mirror image of Spock, basically. Yeah, yeah. you know, the, the, if you take the nature nurture argument about Spock, about his Vulcan nature and his human nurturing. She's the reverse. Yeah, that's really interesting. I have to, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop bashing Burnham and think about that because that's a that's a really interesting observation um, that I hadn't really put together. The, the other thing I really disliked about um, Discovery and 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 well, we can move on to Picard after this. Um, um, I thought that, and I, I promised you before we started that this wasn't going to be me me bashing these shows uh, for for being too woke for an hour and a half. Um, because that is the stand the standard hate fest on these shows is that is around the wokeness, right? I mean, that's their that's people's sure, yeah. main, and that's not my main complaint. But there is one is one of my complaints, and so let me just sort of get it out of the way now. And I really don't have this complaint with regard to Picard; it's only in Discovery. There were just a couple of moments uh, that are so cringingly bashing you over the head with with what a, a contemporary um, a contem- a contemporary sort of political value, right? So let me just give two examples, right? Or three examples. 
this one almost made me stop watching the show. This happens in the middle of episode, in the middle of the second season. I literally was so disgusted. I stopped watching the show for three days. <laughs> um, it's after the engineer. I, I, it's after Hugh is brought back to life. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so, so the, the Hugh is the romantic partner of the engineer. Um, and, um, and I, I forgot the engineer's name. It's like, what is it? It's something with an S stamp statement. Not, I don't remember. It doesn't matter. The blonde engineer, <laughs> um, yeah, and, uh, the do- <laughs> and, and, and the doctor, right. Are a couple. And, um, the the doctor whose name is Huey gets killed and then later he gets brought back to life. It's a, it's a, it's it's done relatively well. Um, um, I thought there was a little bit too much of that sort of oh he's dead oh no he isn't. Um, in general, but there's a scene where um, Michelle Yeoh's character who is playing the mirror universe version of the character that died in the first season, right? Um, and that, is it Michelle Yeoh? Is that the actress? I think yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, she is presented as this kind of really, um, how shall I say, uh, sexually explicit, hardcore, tough chick kind of thing. And there's this hugely cringy moment where the engineer and the, and the, and his husband and the husband, they're a gay couple are, are talking. They're in a room with a bunch of, including Michelle Yeoh. And at one point, the engineer thinks Michelle Yeoh is sort of flirting with her, hitting on Hugh. And he says, you do realize he's gay, right? And Michelle Yeoh says, well, where I come from, we're all kind of non-binary. And she goes on to talk about just, I, I, we're all pansexuals. And I just, I almost took my, my computer and threw it out the window. It made me so mad. I'm just like, do you want Donald Trump to be president forever? If you do, keep shoving that into people's programs, right? I mean, keep shoving that into people's fucking TV programs. Now, that drove me crazy. I thought it was just cringy, gratuitous. It was just a, kind of offensive. It was such obvious pandering. Um, However. Yes, go ahead. Yes. Remember, these, are from the, these guys are from the evil side, so it could be implied that that's, an evil value system. Yeah, but you know that it isn't, right? I mean, come on. I mean, I mean, it, it's just, a, it's very, aside from the politics of it, it's a very strange thing to do, right? It's just very weird. You, it doesn't fit. We don't, that's just not what, 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 what this kind of programming does. I mean, I don't know. It's just very strange. The other things are, the other two things um, are, um, there's a character who's like the sciencey character her name is Tilly, who just makes me want to swallow rat poison. Like, I mean, I just, I cannot stand listening to her talk for even, th- listening to her talk gives me anxiety attacks, right? Um, there's clearly supposed to be something off with her, right? Um, and I, I don't get what the point of that is, what the, what the point of her is supposed to be. I mean, other than sort of like, well, here's our handicapped can, uh, ca- character, right? Um, and then with Spock, they make Spock have dyslexia. But his dyslexia is actually a great gift because if he didn't have the dyslexia, he wouldn't have been able to solve some code, right? Mm-hmm. Now, do you, A, do you find this at all pandering, insulting, stupid and 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 if and and if so or if not why and then why are they doing this i mean why why is there such a feeling why does there feel such a need to pander in this way if you accept that it's pandering now if you don't i'd hear be interesting to hear your reasons why but that's well um i i guess i need to take a number of these in reverse order Um, whatever you want this is your but the uh I would. I, I can't help but at least before entering into this territory, I've kind of think that specifically within the context of Star Trek as a franchise, okay. you've cre- you've created a sort of category error with your critiques because sure. the the, prim- the premise of using a uh, future based outward looking. Uh, 
voyaging somewhat scientifically or mostly scientifically literate uh, program to hammer at the loudest possible bang on social issues, on social issues. It's in the mission statement of Roddenberry's ethos to begin with. So if you're going to complain about that within Star Trek, I think you're kind of playing in a game that's already rigged and you, you have to reject the entire original series. If, if, if that is a a complaint that's going to have you rejecting, and you've already said that these are, Minor issues that you were able to get over with uh, to begin with, but I had to at yeah, least yeah, yeah, note yeah. that. And, and I do, ha- I have considered what you've just said because that's the most common counter argument that's made. And I do have a response, but I want to hear your full take. I, I want to hear your full take on these elements. Uh, you know, let's say even that yes, the show is always let's say pandered, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, is but aside good? from that, is it good though? <laughs> um. Okay, yes, that's a much more fair, yes. Uh, I think a challenge to anyone working on a Star Trek program is to handle these sort of issues with more subtlety, more nuance, uh, more analogy and metaphor versus blatant neon sign billboard, here is our message. I grant you that completely. And on the examples you've cited, I think I have differing takes. Sure. I might, I might, uh, I will concede the uh, Spock dyslexia point, um, although I'm at a loss to imagine it being generated primarily out of any kind of political or wokeness um, messaging. I That smells to me like a writer trying to find some sort of intellectual deficiency in a character that's always been portrayed as, you know, I mean, he's not human, he's, he's Vulcan, but he's been portrayed in this like superhuman computer, like to have a weakness to give him a weakness. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I would think that the writers came at it from that first versus a, uh, like a a Hollywood liberal committee meeting where they're like, okay, which, which malady are we going to try to uh, humanize and shed some positive light on? I could be wrong in this particular instance, but yeah. that one in particular smells to me like it came from something else. Um, Tilly, I actually like adored as a character. I like the character. <laughs> and, I just and, want to punch her all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've had some friends say the exact same thing, so you're not, you're not alone there. What do you but, like about her character? What I like about her character, and you can correct me if if this exists in Deep Space Nine in a degree that I'm not aware of, but in the franchises that I've encountered, Star Trek has been peopled by entirely self-assured, self-confident, like military cadet types who um, know their place, know their mission, know their capacities, and have zero... Uh, moments of self-doubt and it even comes down to like the aesthetics of the characters like everyone else is perfectly physically fit perfectly skinned uh, and and she is portrayed it's kind of a little rough around the edges um and kind of awkward and bumping into things and um i felt she was that i hate this term so much but i'm going to use it is the most relatable character I've ever had in the Star Trek universe. They tried to do this with Wesley Crusher, and I think they failed uh, to to large degrees to have someone a little more relatable on you know in the context of these shows. Yeah. And that's where I like her. Um, the what about the what about the Michelle Yeoh uh, declaring the pansexuality of the uh, of the uh, mirror universe and. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that, non-binary that's non-binary identities and actually, you know what? I'm I'm going to put myself in some dangerous territory here and say something that you may have some sympathy with. Um, I think that the the um, the major difficulty I have with Michelle Yeoh's character is 
um, rooted in something that's really hard to talk about and that she is one of the most gifted actors in the world. You know, if you've seen her perform, she's, she's one of the greatest people. And I think she was in, she was in crouching tiger. The first time I saw her was crouching tiger, hidden dragon, which not only was visually spectacular, but I, her performance was so emotionally powerful. Yeah. That, that, that her being in this show was a plus to me. Um, um, I I struggled with her in the first season quite a lot, and I th- I think it is pretty apparent, at least to me, that she struggles mightily with English as a language. You and think I so? just I just wish she would have been allowed to to say all of her dialogue in her native tongue. And and subtitle her. I didn't even um, consider that. That's so interesting. I, is that something that you know, or are you just guessing from the way that the lines are delivered in the show? I'm just, I'm just guessing it from the way that the lines are delivered in the show. And I felt, though, that once we got the Mirror Universe version of her, she's kind of so um, transformed and becomes a different character there that she speaks in these declarative, just really – staccato deliveries mm. to where it works. It works fine at that point. And I, I just think that um, in the, the first season in the pilot episode, there was no one around to just say, gosh, this, this just doesn't seem to be working. Yeah. Um, and yeah. like, if, if you want to like label some sort of like ultra wokeness uh, problem with, with her character, that's where I, that's yeah, it wasn't, where I would. It wasn't so much her character. It was just that one episode, that scene. I just thought, I, it felt to me like it just was like, like somebody like had written an episode and then somebody said, oh, we need to drop in at least one reference to non-binary and pansexual. Um, and so let's figure out a place to shove it in. Oh, we can shove it in here. Um, but, you know, I appreciate that. that the that's point- quite that's quite possible. That one sounds more possible to me than the Spock one. That's yeah, sure. although, although your point about con- being conspiratorial is well taken. It probably, probably nothing works like that, actually, um, <laughs> the way these shows are created. And so that's fair enough. Let me just say one last thing about Tilly, and then I'll, we'll move on to Picard. Um, um, we can move on to the second thing, which is how these fare as Star Trek shows. Um, actually, there is an analog to Tilly in The Next Generation. And in and in Voyager, and that's okay. Barkley. Barkley. Yes. Okay. Right? Yes. Now, yes. But here's the thing: I love Barkley. Yeah. <laughs> and I can't stand Tilly. And I wonder whether. And, and here's my perception. And, and since I, my reputation doesn't matter as much as yours does, I'll, I'll say the I'll say the terrible things. Um, it seems to me that the difference between Barkley and Tilly, and the reason why I find Barkley really endearing and I love the character and why, why I want to, I want to, I want to throw Tilly out and Van Airlock is because we've become really, really smarmy now about disability. And in the days when, in other words, we become so smarmy about disability that, that, that it now makes me unsympathetic to disabled characters because of the way they're presented. Um, whereas Barkley, um, 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 my, my impression of Tilly is that she's supposed to be someone sort of Asperger is there's a sense that I'm supposed to, that, that I'm getting from her. If that's incorrect, um, I'm happy to be corrected and Barkley also, but Barkley was less functional than, than Tilly. I mean, Barkley yeah. really had serious problems, but somehow, there was, I guess, in my view, this, there wasn't this effort to constantly sort of tell, shove the message that disabilities are really advantages, right? Right. You know what I mean? There's a little bit of this sort of, you know, you know, part of the reason why it's a disability is because actually it sucks, right? Um, and yes, we should treat people well. And yes, we should do everything we can to accommodate. And yes, but to try and act like, it's not really a disability. It's an advantage. I find that kind of smarmy and irritating, and I find it sort of vaguely insulting um, because anybody who's in these these situations has to, you know, know that it's it's not an advantage. It's a, it's a hardship, and especially when when the society is not accommodating, it's a hardship. And so, I guess I felt a little bit like the way Barkley was handled was much more realistic about what the impact of such a disability would be. I'm sorry. If you act like Tilly, 
you're not getting up in the ranks in any, in any serious organization, right? You cannot behave like that and be put in a flagship starship, right? You cannot, I mean, she acts like a 12 year old. Um, she acts like an idiot savant 12 year old. Like she's a genius at certain things, but she's completely, and I guess I just found it really non believable. Um, whereas Barkley, I found completely believable because his problems did indeed impede him. I mean, he could not function, you know, he, he could only work within a relatively narrow parameter of the, of the Star Trek universe. He was in constant therapy with Troy. I mean, Troy was his therapist, and they, they had great plot lines around that. I guess I just felt like her character suffered for the way that the whole topic is dealt with now, which in my view is a much more juvenile, less realistic way than the topic might have been dealt with, let's say, 25 or 30 years ago. Again, if you don't want to comment on this, I understand, but that was my, my problem with Tilly. Um, it wasn't I... her per se. Was nothing wrong with the performance. It was. I have a problem with being told I'm supposed to believe that that sort of character could get anywhere in Starfleet near where she got, right? Behaving like that. So, did it not us upset your suspension of disbelief at all? It 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 definitely pushed at the membrane. I will I'll concede that. But I I just had a fundamentally different interpretation of what we're supposed to expect that that character's. Um, you didn't think that she was a current sort of Barkley, uh, meant to be a kind of a Barkley. I, I think Barkley was clearly more impeded, um, and that his behavior, uh, much more extreme uh, he, and unacceptable, sort of socially yeah, yeah. unacceptable. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I, I feel that Tilly's. First of all, I don't, I didn't take her as necessarily being on the Asperger spectrum um, or having. Um, a series of conditions that would be rightly termed as a disability. Yeah. I just, oh, I just, really? took them, I just took them as common everyday, uh, you know, foibles, common everyday insecurities, common everyday um, quirks that in a normally in a, in a militaristic setting would yes, indeed imp- impede someone's, uh, progress for sure, yeah. but that's that's what kind of endeared the character to me, in that you know so much of Star Trek is a very sterile yeah. way, not just aesthetically, but also in ways of thinking. And I thought that that was the role that she she portrayed, that she was um, able to quote unquote think outside of the normal structures and ways of, of strategy that that would constrain most Starfleet people. Yeah. And so um yeah. I thought that was her virtue. Um Yeah. Maybe maybe I maybe I was uh, taking too simple of a read of her. No, no, I I'm I'm actually now starting to both with regard to Burnham and now with regard to her I'm starting to wonder whether I just got the wrong impression altogether. And 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 connected together things that aren't connected. So I I I was connecting her to the Spock with the dyslexia and just like, okay, we're just getting messaged over and over again. Disabilities are really advantages. Disabilities are really advantages, right? Sort of almost like being propagandized to, but now I'm realizing that that may be a completely faulty comparison. Uh, if she's not even meant that to, that to represent that at all, if she's just meant to represent sort of a, an ordinary person who's got the ordinary awkwardnesses and insecurities and stuff, which I, I, I'd have to watch it again to, to think, which I definitely will, um, to, to figure that out. Um, let's um, move on then to the um, – I will just say, let me say one thing just, just so that people will not think I'm a complete troglodyte. Um, <laughs> um, I actually thought that the gay relationship between Anthony Rapp and whoever the actor is that plays the, the doctor um, was – and I know you said you actually found rap very annoying. I thought that their relationship is one of the best romantic relationships that's ever been done in Star Trek, like long form. Um, I thought it was very realistic. I thought it was not pandery at all. Um, um, and I thought that a lot of some of the best dramatic tension moments uh, uh, actually came out of it. Um, I agree. Um, however, for me, I thought it was all very of well that, done, really well all done. All of that, to me happened after the guy died, like up until he died. I, I just felt it was a standard, you know, Star Trek romance, regardless of uh, gender or sexuality. But once he died and I thought the performances were elevated too, the writing performances, everything. And like from that moment on, 
I, I loved Anthony Rapp's performance. Um, I don't know who the other actor who played the doctor. I, f- I, I find him extremely likable. Um, yeah, he was. Um, he seems to have, he was he seems to have in, spiritual depth, which mm-hmm, is hard to yeah. convey in, in a show like this. What is he from? Or where is he? What's he been in? Well, he was quite an iconic character in that he was. Uh, he was on that show, My So Called Life, uh, on ABC, which kind right. of was was very trailblazing in its depiction. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, um, so, that's right. Um, I, for- I totally forgot about. It. I really, I, I liked, I liked him blanking on his name. Uh, Michael Aceveda, maybe. Does that sound yeah. right? Well, people can look it up. I, I, I like him a lot. Um, all right, let's not talk about discovery. Can I, yeah, go ahead. No, anything you want. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to add. If we're going to switch to Picard, the one problem I had with Discovery is a Star Trek show. Do you want to just talk about? These are Star Trek shows later. It doesn't matter. Um, if you, if you want, if, I was going to say the sort of the, the, the non Star Trek show things about Picard, I thought didn't work. Um, okay. Um, um, well, but if you want to do them one show at a time, I have no problem with that. We, this could maybe serve as a segue then if, if, if that's a lot of your uh, angle. It's just that I loved Discovery on, on its just pure entertainment value. Um, it, 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 it didn't have very high aspirations. I'm grading it on the scale of just a regular uh, entertainment sci-fi show. But I think Picard had much higher aspirations. But I just never felt like it was a Star Trek show. I never felt that Roddenberry ethos, and I just felt that that was inherent in the um, the choices they made at the very beginning to make it take place during a war and make it be set on a ship that is an active participant in a war. Yeah. And, you know, the, the Anthony Rapp character we were just talking about, he does speak to this. He's, you know, he's conflicted at a few times in the show saying that, hey, this is supposed to be a science vessel, not a military ship. And, you know, that tension is always in Star Trek. Yeah. Um, but the balance, I think, has been much better. You know, there were, there was always like one or two warlike episodes in a whole season Whereas this was the entire focus of the show was they were at war and it just didn't, I didn't get that sense of discovery. Yeah. Like the, the thing that I want them to get back to um, at some point with some show, it's, I still want to get back to great yes. new world, you know, yes. New worlds, new civilizations. Yes. Boldly go where no one's gone before that sort of thing. I, yeah. I want yeah. to get back to that somehow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I don't know. Look, it, it's weird the way season two ended. Right. It's like and the Enterprise is going to go off and do that with Pike at the helm of it, but Discovery is going to still be doing whatever the shit it's doing now is the sense I got, which is I thought the end of season two was kind of weird. It's like, wait a minute. So does that mean now Pike's out of the show and now Sharu yeah. or Sabu or whatever is his name is now the captain? And – I, I don't know. I just found that a little odd. Um, um, the way that they did that. Um, that the, I think they're set up to actually do what I want, though. They're so far in the future, and they're going to be off, uh, off the grid of what is known. That I think they'll be able to do some exploratory things. You don't think it'll go? It'll go episodic, do you? In season three, because of that, it might go a little bit more. It might. I don't know. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um. The, the, sort of the problems I have with Picard, um, a lot of them are going to be Star Trek problems. Um, but part of the problems I had with it had to do with serial, the serialized format, which I told, talked to you about. I think in Picard, much more than in, in, in Discovery, I agree with you. There's just, it seems like a lot of filler. It seems to me like you could have done that season in half the number of episodes. Um, um, I just felt like this thing was just getting st- got stretched and stretched and stretched. Um, I also found, I got to tell you, I just found the way that this all ended. I, I found the way that this all ended up to be very, um, to be very uh, unsatisfying and just almost sort of like I had like a what reaction? Like Picard is now an Android. I mean, seriously, you know what I mean? I mean, that's not even just, that's not even bad Star Trek. That's just bad. It seems to me, isn't it? I mean, the whole thing was I wanted to, I watching the show because it's about Picard, but now it's not Picard. It's a fucking Android, right? 
I, I don't, why did they do that? I mean, why? I, and, and, and the whole thing with data made no sense. Why, why was data hanging out in the simulation for the last 20 years if there are Android bodies he can, he can be downloaded into? And why, why then when he finally comes out, does he want does does he want to be killed immediately? Why doesn't why doesn't he just live out his life like a normal and die the way that Picard's going to? <coughs> it, it just it made it to, to me this was just a flat out failure of writing. It just made no sense. Um, do, do you have any feelings about this? Do you, did I am I wrong? Did I, did I miss something? Or do you think this makes sense? I think as a goal, it's it was a fascinating choice and i thought it to make um, him an android yes and he, here's why um now it, i'm i'm somewhat um ambivalent on the possibilities of season two uh just for for a number of reasons the the main showrunner is leaving um but he did have a lot of input into season two so who knows my my concerns may not be valid but if, if I think of the most compelling uh, storylines and relationships of Picard from The Next Generation, it's, number one, the transformation of himself into a Borg, into Locutus, mm. and then being mm. unborged, exborged, and being haunted by that for the rest of his life. And there were key moments after the... Wow stupendous two-part best of both worlds episode where Picard would revisit that. And you always got the sense there was this haunted haunted him. There was this glint in his eye of like, they, they may have removed the implants, but there's a piece of that locutus Borg that has been in his psyche forever. And here's a guy who's retired from uh, Starfleet um, or quit Starfleet rather uh, cer- unceremoniously and uh, con- uh, controversially, uh, and he has all this time on this on this vineyard. And you've got to think that that experience had to keep cycling back into his head. And so now, ultimately, um, he's going to have to. He, he's he's got that as a destiny now. He's going to be reintegrated with a totally artificially uh, uh, artificial life existence. And that's also interesting to me in that one of, if not the most interesting relationship he had was with Data. And he was always fascinated by Data's uh, human and non-human components. And now he's going to get to experience that now, but in a different vessel in this golem that they've created for him. So I think it's ripe for interesting material in season two. And it's an interesting angle to choose how we got there, especially in the last couple of episodes of the season, I felt were executed pretty clunkily. Um, But just as far as the choice itself, I thought was interesting. Did you, did you think, did you, did you, do you share my feelings about the, the pacing of the show and that it did not, that, that, that the serialization, in a sense, stretched it out, that it was too long? I, I definitely agree. Um, I, I understand that your perception is that it could be cut in half. I think in reality, you could maybe make it an eight or nine episode season mm. and still cover all the same bases, and it wouldn't have that feeling of um, of uh, so much fat on the edges. Yeah. Um, mm. But... Um, I'll meet you halfway there, say okay. seven episodes. <laughs> well, let's, let's then segue, as you said, into the, into uh, the issue of um, these shows as Star Trek shows. Um, and let's start with Picard since we're on it already, because um, I have less complaints about it than about discovery in that regard. I do think that Picard feels like Star Trek in a way that discovery does not. Part of that has to do with the visual aesthetic 
um, um, and you know the, the the uniforms and discovery and stuff are just appalling. I was so happy <laughs> when when they brought back the original series uniforms, and then it was miserable when they just took them away from me again. I was like, wait a minute, come back. <laughs> um, 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 I was like, and I was actually thinking about the end of season two. You know, I would really rather watch a show about Pike on the Enterprise than I, I agree would watch. There. Then I would rather I watch, then I would watch want to watch Discovery, which is another thing that I think is a creative failure, right? I mean that's that's a disaster. I mean I mean you create a show and then this is the show and then you have somebody leave the show and and, and the audience would rather watch a show about that guy who's leaving, right? <laughs> right. Um, I um, completely agree there. Um, but anyway, um, here's my problem with Picard, and look, my problem in both cases has a lot to do with retconning. Um, 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 much more so in Discovery. Um, but in Picard, it's a little subtler. But let me just try and communicate how, what I think about this and see what you think about it. Um, <clears throat> there's, 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 there's two major things that, to my mind, screw up Picard as a Star Trek show, um, and 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 they really, I think, they matter. Okay. Um, the first is the just gratuitous amounts of violence and foul and foul language and sadism and foul language. In my view, at the end of the day, Star Trek should be a show that you can watch with your children. Right? No, I actually really think that this is a betrayal. I think that this is a very serious thing. I'm angry about it. I don't understand why they did it. The shows, neither Discovery nor Picard are suitable for younger children. They're just not. Partly because of the gratuitous violence, partly because of the foul language, partly because of, I don't understand it. I don't understand. It adds nothing. I don't watch Star Trek for the same reason that I watch the Terminator. Nobody does, right? So I'm, I, I don't understand this decision. I don't understand. I mean, there are actually there are critics who are keeping a murder count in Picard about how many people are just flat out murdered, right? And it's rather shocking. Um, 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 and so I, I'm very interested to hear your thoughts on that. The other thing I really object to, so in that sense, it completely it makes Char Star Trek unsuitable for children, which to me is a deal breaker, um, and should be a deal breaker because it seems to me young people are the natural audience for science fiction television. I'm not saying that there's not room for adult programs like The Expanse, um, 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 or you know, or 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 something like that. But not, but Star Trek has always been a show that 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 was aimed at both young and, and adult audiences. It was a show families could watch together, and and so this this really bothers me. I don't understand why they did it. I'm hoping you'll have some thoughts on it. The other thing I really don't like is. I think that they retconned Picard's personality to the point to which I just don't think that these are the same characters, right? Um, he is now, I don't, listen, I understand him being having some self-doubt, help, self-doubts. I understand him having some, you know, you know, the things that come with old age. I don't, but he is so, so tormented, so tortured. He is so hapless. I mean, he basically can't do anything anymore. And now everybody, you know, he's no longer competent to do anything anymore. Um, 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 if more often than not, he's being corrected, right? And, 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 and overridden. And I just thought this was completely inconsistent with the character. Now you want to talk about an almost godlike character where I thought it was actually pulled off, right? It was Picard. In other words, he has been so diminished that I that I find it not only jarring, but I don't find it a believable. I don't find it believable. So, what what do you think about those two things um, um, yourself? And do you have any complaints about Picard as a Star Trek show? Well, I think Picard was the most interesting experiment in seeing how far you could uh, push the boundaries of what can be considered Star Trek. And I think that's one of the interesting things that we're dealing with now mm. with the explosion of so many different um, transmedia platforms uh-huh. that, that we, we have the opportunity to make 
niche versions of something that has larger appeal and see if that's a viable strategy or not. And I think there are going to be some successes and some failures in that. And I think you completely persuaded me that Picard fails on the tone, um, on the, the gratuitous violence. And you language. Not, do you, did you find that somewhat shocking or, or is it? Um, I personally, um, you know, I'm, uh, I have no children, so I I tend to gravitate towards more quote unquote adult programming generally. But didn't you come um, to Star Trek yourself as a child? Right, right, right. I did. Yeah, and I feel like the the language and violence in this show in particular gave me nothing, and that's why I object to it. Mm. Um, based on at, based on what you have described, we lose so much in that uh, in that choice. And what we gain is nothing. Yeah. Now, <laughs> there there are other franchises and other characters that I think you could make that kind of choice and come away with something very interesting. Uh, but this Look, is I think not the Expanse that. is a great show. Well, I mean, even something like the thing that I first think of, and this is outside of Trek, but um, uh, one of the best comic book series in the past 10 years um, was a run on the character of Hawkeye. And it was kind of a grittier, grounded, um, crime, local uh, story. And it, it actually was not gratuitous in its language or violence, but I could see someone that adapted that comic could maybe go that direction, and it would be just fine. It would be totally out of character with what you see in the MCU, but I think it would be a fantastic so show. You think it's okay to have Star Trek that's not meant for children. You just don't think that it was done well in this one. Yeah, I, I think I would I wouldn't take like a beloved character like Picard or Spock or Kirk and make that choice. I would do I would I would go with a new character to 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 make that sort of exploration. Yeah. Yeah. And so in that respect I, th- I think uh, I-, I completely agree with you. On Picard himself, I'm torn because I think everything you've described about... Do you think he was kind of weirdly incompetent throughout the show? Well, I think he was humongously constrained, but I think those are more environmental forces and structural forces that are against him based on the, the, the premise of the entire show. He's, he's basically cut off from Starfleet, he he has none of his resources or most of his resources are cut off from him. And yet, in spite of that, he still manages to pull off saving the galaxy. Yeah. So he he still does have that capacity. Now, in a moment-to-moment, episode-to-episode basis, I did feel there were a number of times where other characters were taking charge, and I felt they were pulling back on Picard, and I think they were making those choices partly just because of the character's age. Um, I thought maybe a number of times they felt like, ah, well, we would want to have him take charge here, but he's a frail old man. He's supposed to be 94 in the show. So it just might not be believable for him to do this. Um, And there was also just the story element of him having reticence to, you know, command somebody else's ship. He's, he's hired this, you know, yeah. Uh, this guy to to ferry him around, so he never gets to sit in the captain's chair except for once at the very end. Um, so I I think that they made some bad choices there and diminished him somewhat there. But I still felt I still felt like I was watching Jean Luc Picard. I just I felt he was just ridiculously constrained. <clears throat> so you didn't find him to be an unbelievable version of his much older self. Um, um, I, 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 there were a few times where I felt the Jean-Luc I know and love would have made a different choice, yeah. but I think, I don't think it was, um, in the DNA of every, every choice he made, you know, what about seven of nine? I thought they kind of retconned her too, where I found her somewhat unrecognizable relative to, uh, and, and she was one of those characters that really did develop a lot over the course of her time in Voyager um, <laughs> um, from beginning to end, really quite remarkably. Um, and now she's kind of like a, a bitter, angry, cynical murderess, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, did you find that 
not maybe overly retconned? I, I, I have to confess, I, it's been so long since I experienced Voyager. I, it did feel out of character to me, but I couldn't put my finger on where her journey ended in Voyager. She felt more quote unquote human to me at the end of Voyager. Yeah, but, well, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. But I almost wonder whether the show somewhat suffered from it, it couldn't maybe use some of that filler space to give us more backstory of what happened to these people in between mm-hmm. their main run shows and this, because it might have gone a long way to making me feel less jar, find less jarring the, um, the, uh, the, um, um, the changes in the characters. Hold on one second. I'm going to let my dog out. Nice. You want to go out? <laughs> Hello, doggy. All right, let's talk about Discovery now because I, because that one is the one where I have much more complaints on this front. Um, I find the amount of retconning that they did in Discovery to be just absolutely appalling. Um, um, and I think that, just as a general matter, they've completely destroyed the integrity of the timeline from the original series through. Um, do you have, just generally, do you feel like yeah, it well, ret- it broke the th- It broke it. Yeah. It broke what it was retconning, or do you think it was they pulled it off? Well, I, I think it's a little bit of both because if you take it at face value, it should completely destroy the the technology of the timeline. But technology, for one thing, makes no sense. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. It, very lazily written. Um, I, I do think that Discovery betrayed – they did not have – or if they did, they did not have enough influence, enough science consultants like the original shows did. Um, I just felt like – It almost crossed over into fantasy, I thought. Yeah, yes, yes. It felt like technobabble. It, it felt like, um, you know, almost pandering that, like, okay, we've got to have a sciencey moment here. Let's come up with a neat adjective – um, and the, the, it completely betrays the tradition of <laughs> actually engaging with interesting science concepts. Um, and, you know, you had real scientists um, collaborating with Gene Roddenberry back, back in the original show. Yeah. And, and it, that absence was, a, was a huge gaping void, but also I think it, at least on a technical level, they've with, at the end of season two, they've sort of come up with a weak rationale to where the rest of the Star Trek timeline can have integrity, but it's, it's very weak. I mean, yeah, they're sort of like, okay, all these advances, we're going to, a, we can't use them anymore. And B we're, we're, we're going to all make a pact to not speak about them. Right. I mean, that's, sort right, of, that's right, what they yeah. actually do it. And you're just like, Oh my God. Oh my God. Um, but I thought, you know, that, that, that is a, that's pretty egregious, but I thought even more egregious, and this is consistent with liking on its merits, right? You you yourself said that you particularly thought that the interactions between Michael Burnham and Spock are are strong in terms of their interactions, and I and I'm and I'm I agree with that um, on the on the merits. But I'm sorry, I've watched all of Star Trek. <laughs> Spock does not have a sister. He does not have an adopted sister. He does not have an adopted sister who is so important to Sarek that, like, they're telepathizing across the universe with each other. Yeah. Um, in other words, and again, this also it ties to the first the part. This was just all more part of the trying to inflate Michael Burnham. Right. So let's just make Michael Burnham. What can we do to make, to inflate Michael Burnham? Well, we'll take the most loved character in the series and make it her sister. And not as it just his sister. It's, she's even more important than him. And the, and, and, and his parents care and pay more attention to her. I found that money to tear my hair. You didn't like, you didn't like this whole thing with making her Spock's sister and Sarek and all of that. No, like I, I'm able to at least momentarily set all of that aside just to enjoy this person's performance as Spock. Yeah, those scenes much, are great. 
and the, the would, writing is great, and th- yeah. Uh, yeah, that's not the problem. The problem is, as yeah. Star Trek, it makes no sense. Yeah, it's it's absolutely horrendous, and and to me, it's it's Why somewhat did lazy. Did that? Is it laziness? I, th- there's so much lazy writing in sci-fi to where everybody ends up being a sibling. Um, it's like, or everybody ends up like being Star Wars. Parent. Right? Star Wars did it too. Yes, and like yeah, the most recent Rise of Skywalker. I can't even. I need therapy before I can talk about that one. Um, I think so, even the Luke and Leia being siblings was added later, right? That was not originally, that was not intended yeah. in the first movie, I don't think, right? From what I remember I reading, think, I think that was done retroactively. I, I think that uh, Lucas has said some things that um, made it sound like he intended it all along, but I, I don't believe those statements. Um, I, I think that that was pretty weak. And, and, and the other, the other thing about all of this, um, this is an example of my least favorite genre of toying. And I think the topic you've raised w- with this, I think we can elevate it to not just Star Trek, but to all franchises. The question of what is it to be true, quote unquote, to a franchise, mm. I think it's a fascinating question in this new media environment. And my least favorite form of rebooting or tinkering with is the chess move that I could describe as the everything you thought you know or knew was wrong. Turns out X and that is done so poorly. However, there, there are counter examples and there was one very big just recently that happened that um, was almost the exception that proves the rule that I was floored by and applaud. And I think that what I've come to realize is that it all always comes down to what is it in service of? Um, is it in service of something that helps the story or not? And in this case, I don't think it helped the story any in discovery. You could have had another Vulcan. You could have had another race uh, that had similarly logic or emotionless culture Um Making, or she could have just been brought. She, you could have had exactly the same story where she was adopted, but it didn't have to be Spock's parents that adopted. Yes, her, right? yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, I that to me was just like I didn't understand the point of it. Um, very strange. Um, I also do. You, do you like the way that they're just sort of they just sort of using the mirror universe? No. Um. <sighs> It it felt too soon for for this cast of characters to be introduced to their mirror universe opposite. And like, now Lorca, the novelty. whole season, yeah, Lorca, the whole season you've been watching this guy. Turns out he's a mirror. I mean, I, I just yeah, I, I I don't know. I I found that mystifying as well. Um um, and um and um and then the Klingons, right? And by the way, they've now made excuses about that too. I mean, I mean. So now, did you notice in season two the Klingons are starting to look more and more like actual Klingons? And, and it's not just that they added hair, right. but, but 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 what they tried to tell you that they, they, they that the, what they did was, oh well, these were a bunch of extremists. Yeah. And so they were off in the corner of the galaxy, and they developed their own look, and they had their own, developed their own ship styles and stuff like that. But now that that's done with, now we're going to bring back. Now they're going to look like normal Klingons and be flying in N sevens, right? Yeah. Where were the hell were all those N sevens during the whole war in the first? I'm actually gonna I'm gonna blame this one on <laughs> Trek fans, unfortunately. Oh, um, you mean they screamed such bloody murder that they they pressured the producers. No. Change it. I, well, I, I think in general, one of the endearing qualities of Trek fans is their obsessiveness to detail. And all of the fandoms have their own flavor of this and their own yes. clutching of what should be canon and what isn't and all of this. Um, I would have liked that the, you know, the more human uh, Klingons that we saw in the original series – the, the cool Klingons that we saw in the movies and in the next generation. And then these weird Klingons <laughs> had, had no actual physiological story explanation. I would have much rather the aesthetic differences just simply be that and we've got different even, don't artists. Even explain it. Don't even explain it. We've got different artists interpreting these visuals differently. Like I'm a comic book fan. And so I love seeing 
all of these characters drawn by different just, artists. Yeah, why be so literal about it, right? Is yeah, like, just, yeah. Just set it aside. Don't explain it. And if people hate it that much, bring the new guys in, bring it back, and just pretend like it never happened. Right, but that's better than not explaining it is better than these ridiculous yes, yes. explanations. Um, I heard yeah. one good explanation about the original ju- difference between the the original series of Klingons and the next generation Klingons that actually came out of one of the books. And that is that the, the human looking Klingons were originally meant to be il- infiltrators that they were, that oh, they, were okay. they were deliberately altered so that they could infiltrate into, uh, into, into uh, human environments. Um, um, and then I don't know if you remember how uh, you didn't watch deep space nine. There's a great episode of deep space nine called trials and tribulations. Mm-hmm. When they go into the the t- trouble with tribbles episodes from the original series, and they no, actually, I did see that one. I did okay, see so that. You one. Saw, so you saw that one, right? Um, and um, um, if you remember what Worf says, they they all look at him and they the the fight scene in the bar where they get with the Federation guys get into a Starfleet guys get into a fight with the Klingons, and one like O'Brien or somebody says to Worf. Those are Klingons, and Worf says it's a very long story. I'm not going to tell you now. Yeah, yeah. And, it's, and, and, and I, I love that, right? I love that yeah, they did yeah. that, and it worked so much better than this bullshit explanation. Yeah. Again. Okay, so yeah. we agree we don't like a lot. Of, we don't like a lot of retconning, and we think it was done pretty ham-fistedly in in Discovery. But it does beg the much more important question, which is what we're going to close on, and that that where I really want you to talk more than me, um, since you are a writer of comics. Um, <sighs> You have franchises both in comics and television that are now 50, go on 50, 60, 70 years. I mean, I mean, some of these go back to the Second World War, right? Um, 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 what has to happen? How do you continue a beloved franchise while constantly generating new, cre- appealing to new audiences, right? While bringing the the, the the base the core audience along with you you know bands long living bands have this problem too right yeah 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 um and i'm interested in hearing your thoughts not just about how star trek is doing that yeah but how you think it's best done right uh and it's happening in marvel comics i mean now i'm supposed to th- not believe that iron man is a 15 year old black girl i mean I, you know the, all these things i you know I immediately react like, oh, my God, that, that's infuriating. I can't even it, – it's – uh, right? But then I do ask myself in a comment, wait a minute. How the hell can this comic series go on for 50 years? Yeah. And not change anything, right? Because the audiences change. Everything changes. And plus, the characters just get old if you have them in real time. Although, I guess I don't – never really quite understood why in those universes you had to have it in real time. In other words, I don't see why they can't just stay the same age forever – you know what I mean? In other words, I don't see any reason why, in principle. Um, it seems to me the more reason would be that you want that you're the changing audiences over the years, right? Um, so, so even though I cringe when I hear that you know Iron Man's going to be a 15 year old girl, I do recognize, on the other hand, that there's a serious challenge to writers who are fall and find themselves writing in these gigantic franchises in which there are these long, long standing uh, tropes and expectations and understandings and investments. What, what are your, what's your feeling about this issue about how Star Trek handle it? And in your view, how you think it's best done? Well, I have to confess at, at the start and I, I hate to disappoint you here because you invited me in, uh, presuming I have a good answer to this question, I'm literally about to take a workshop class on this very topic um, that is going to be led by someone who recently rebooted an iconic um, Marvel franchise. And I hope to learn at the feet of a master. um, What's the class? Where's this class? Uh, It's a, it's online workshop. Um, I've learned a lot of comics writing through a workshop that I'm a part of called comics experience. And they have classes that are led by uh, veterans of the industry. The guy that runs the workshop is Andy Schmidt, who was an editor at Marvel Comics for a good number of years. And the thing he would most be recognized for, uh, if you enjoyed the Marvel Cinematic Universe movie, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy, 
he's basically the guy that brought those characters together from disparate places and made them into a team and created the, the concept of that. So uh, he's a very well-known guy throughout the industry. I've learned a lot from him. And uh, this question specifically in comics is very difficult because they, they have a devoted fan base that is aging and um, they've approached it a number of different ways. Um, about 10 years ago, DC comics did a full reboot. They said everything that happened you mean of the whole universe of the whole universe. They how, said, did they, okay. how did they do it? Okay. So what they did is they ended all of their comics and said, Batman, Batman number, you know, 912, that's your last issue of Batman. Uh, the next one's going to be Batman number one. And it's going to start in a completely new universe, a completely new interpretation of all of the different history, characters. different, different history, different, different everything. villains, different everything. Right. Why? Um, but then why not simply create a new character? Why? That's what I don't understand. Well, there's, there's two difficulties with that. One problem is that the audiences that sustain the comic book industry, sadly, are so devoted to these iconic characters, they're hesitant to embrace new characters. So the, the sort of have your cake and eat it to approach that comics has taken is to do what's called the so-called legacy character, which is to take on the mantle, take on the uniform, take on the iconography of a, a given character and move it with a new person in the uniform. So there have been multiple Captain Americas. There have been multiple Batmans. Uh, as you say now, there's new Iron Man. There's a new Spider-Man. There have been multiple Spider-Man. Um, and that has succeeded or failed to wildly different degrees. Um, but let me ask you this while you're on this, because this fascinates me. Have the audiences changed? I mean, because look, so my, my era of comics is the 1970s, the silver age. Um, and um, that's that that's the era in which I was collecting. That's the era that I remember the most. I would argue that it is also the era it was also the peak for Marvel. Um, um, I, I, I think that 70s into the early 80s was sort of the peak for Marvel, at least in terms of my, my conception of it. Um, um, but I can remember all through the 70s, brand new series starting yeah. with brand new heroes, right? I mean, I, mean, I mean, look, the X-Men were one, right? I mean, they were new, right? Um, 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 uh, and I can I can think of not only individual superheroes that were new and introduced, um, you know, Moon Knight. I can remember when he was introduced. I remember getting the f number one. I, I, why all of a sudden now do audiences not want new new characters and new new franchises? That's the thing they do, and they don't realize it. Um, there was a there was a fascinating lecture that I I learned a lot from by Matthew Weiner the. Uh, the head writer for the TV show Mad Men. And one of the mantras that he always told all the writers in his room is that audiences actually don't know what they want. They think they know what they want, but they actually don't. And where that lesson can be most simplified in the fact is like a lot of times the best stories are about presenting a character and giving them a, a desired goal or outcome, and then day after day after day denying them that goal. Deny, deny, deny. And through those tribulations of denying them that goal is the drama. That's what brings the audiences back and back and back. But if the audience were to articulate to you, like, oh, why, why can't we just give – Why can't it's like um, the TV example, um, Cheers, Sam and Diane. You know, if you ask the person on the street, why don't they just get Sam and Diane get together already? Why don't they do it? And then, of course, the answer is because once you do it, it sucks. Yeah, that actually uh, killed Moonlighting, the, the show Moonlighting. Yeah. I don't know if you remember. Yeah. yeah. The whole yeah. show was built around the tension. Yes, yes. And so you have that same dynamic play out with, you know, we're talking about comics now. Um, they, to answer your question about the audience – this is a very interesting and tumultuous time in comics and especially because of the coronavirus stuff, it's, it's adding another layer of, um, 
uh, crisis to it. But when, when DC rebooted their entire universe 10 years ago, they, they did a survey and they actually, um, had, um, marketing people in comic shops and did this exhaustive survey of who actually comes into the stores. And they were kind of depressed with the results because it was essentially, it was just, you know, 40 and 50 year old white dudes. And that was what was sustaining the industry pandering to them. Whereas the format of reading comics as a storytelling medium, pictures and words on balloons is thriving in other areas, specifically with manga and with children's uh, comic stories. And so the mainstream comics people have tried lots of different strategies to attract those audiences. So wait, so let me just start. So today what you're saying is the classic superhero comics are being read by older people. Yes. The kids are reading for the most part. The kids are reading something else. Yes. They they will be do we know why? In other words, why were superhero comics a children's medium when I was a kid? But Mm -hmm. no long but no longer. Do, do, Do we have any idea why? I think there's a little bit of a chicken and egg scenario here because the audiences, as they grew up, they started craving more adult themes. And that's when you get the whole quote unquote grim and gritty Mm. uh, dark superhero stuff that started in the late eighties. Right. Batman, Dark Knight, the Frank Miller, Dark Knight was one of the first. Yeah, exactly. And then of course, Watchmen. Right. And then the imitators of that did a very poor job and, essentially they just filled the content with uh, gratuitous violence, gratuitous, you know, rape became a trope that's just like ridiculously overused in superhero comics, uh, has no place. And so, Bizarre. so there's this, there was this sort of self-perpetuating problem. So, um, hmm. you know, it, it's something that they're trying to, uh, Revisit and a number of strategies are working. Like, for example, the, the movie, um, the, uh, Into the Spider Verse that came out a couple of years ago was beloved, you know, across all age ranges. That's a, is that animated? It, yeah, it's animated. Yeah. Have you, yeah. you, have you not seen that one yet? No. I, I highly recommend that. And that one centers on the new Spider Man, Miles Morales, who's half African American, half Latino. Um, and he originally came from, um, a different quote unquote universe, but then got pulled into the correct universe or whatever. And that, that film deals with the concept of uh, a multiverse and multiple different versions of Spider-Man. And it kind of wrestles with the very thing that comics itself is wrestling with, yeah. like how to reinvent these characters. And that was uh, a fantastic example of it working. How about so let's just end end on Star Trek. Um, how do you think Star Trek is managing its, you know, if the idea is, okay, this is a franchise that goes back to the mid-1960s, like Doctor Who, right? And, and Doctor Who had a major, its major reboot happened some years ago um, with the Christopher Eccleston era um, and um, is widely viewed to have been a great success, Right. Um, it completely reignited interest in the in the show, brought a whole new generation of young people into the show who probably have never seen the Hartnell yeah. through Sylvester McCoy era, which of course was my era. Um, there's a, a lot of bitching and moaning about the most recent one, um, um, but I think everybody would say that overall the reboot was an enormous success. A, do you think, is Star Trek trying to do something similar? Is it trying to reboot itself so that it will now be the science fiction show for a new generation uh, of young people, or is it, is it doing something else? I mean, both of us are kind of agreed that neither discovery nor, nor Picard are really very suitable for kids. And so um, are they, what are they doing? What are they doing? What is, what do you think Star Trek is doing or trying to do? I think they're trying to do exactly what you described. Are they trying to do what Dr. Who did? They're trying, and I think they have fallen into um, the trap of being a little bit too insular. Like, the things that really excite 
creative professionals in the storytelling uh, of, of some of these shows are the more adult shows like Breaking Bad, Mad Men, Better Call Saul. And they want to try to put that sort of lens on a, a beloved franchise just to, to a small degree. They are obviously still within the world of, of you know, Starfleet and uniforms and, you know, phasers and all of that, all of the aesthetics that we know of the franchise. Um, but I think that they're finding um, that it's, it's not attracting new people. The, the, the existing Star Trek fans are, are pretty polarized on are both divided of these, over it. And it's not and, bringing in a lot of, you know, it's not bringing in a lot of kids and stuff because it's frankly not really suitable for them. I mean, I, yeah, I, you know, uh, um, so I'll, I, I, I think we, um, we've sort of talked about, they sort of accidentally, I think, discovered the formula. And that is like the way that they treated Pike and Spock, regardless of the retconning, <clears throat> just aesthetically, if they had done that, um, and said it perhaps in a new show with new characters, new captains, new ships, whatever, I think they need to rediscover what was great about the the Roddenberry era and and find a way to translate that to the new generation. Yeah, to and I don't people, think they've done people, it. To young people. Let me let's just close with this last question. Um, because it sounds to me, it seems to me like and I don't know whether Doctor Who was a special case or whether now that's already itself kind of old, its success, and whether things have changed more recently. I'm starting to sort of just wonder whether what the, what this all of this is sort of telling us is that um, young people and children are really just not that as as interested in in this science fiction television as they were when we when you and I were kids. And I'm wondering whether if that's true, is it in part or in good part even, because of video video gaming. In other words, they're getting... I, I don't think that human nature has changed very much, but for a kid who wants to get into science fiction, he can now do it in an entirely different way. He can get, he can get into it through video gaming, and it's much more immersive, right? Mm-hmm. Um, 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 so, you know, if I was a kid... You know, to me, a game like Mass Effect would have the bring the same kind of excitement that mm-hmm. watching the, waiting for the next week of Star Trek would f- for me when I was a kid. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm not so sure if they'd had games like Mass Effect when I was a kid, if I wouldn't have been doing more of that rather than watching television. Do you think that video gaming has really challenged um, comics and science fiction television um, for the youth the youth's attention? I think that's one factor. I can't help but think that, you know, genre storytelling in general is still succeeding quite a lot. And I think audiences, younger audiences tend to prefer fantasy over science fiction at the moment. And they, and when they do have science fiction, it's more dystopian. And I think it's a Mm. reflection of just, the world that, you know, youth culture and yeah. millennials have come up with. Um, whereas the golden era of Dr. Who and Star Trek, you know, came about during the Apollo mission eras and science was a beacon of hopefulness. And now science is often uh, a harbinger of, of ill effects coming our way. Yeah. And in, in science fiction literature itself, there has been a wrestling with this and some people have tried to um, gear towards uh, like consciously push science fiction towards uh, a more aspirational and hopeful uh, category again. And they, they've tried to self brand it as something called solar punk, which is, um, <clears throat> you know, re- imagining more utopian, uh, as the Movian, it's the utopian side to what to cyberpunk, right? So cyberpunk yeah. is dystopian, but right. set less less set and sort of galactic scales and more. In other words, more at the scale of cyberpunk, but a positive side of the utopian yes. rather than dystopian side. Of it. That's right. that's that's very interesting. Has that been successful? 
Um, I don't think there have been any major popular successful examples of the genre. I know that there have been a number of really creative writers who have dabbled in it and presented it, but at the moment, audiences are not flocking to it. So I could see that sparking the interest of young people and children mm-hmm. in television and films. If that, if there ever was a franchise in that genre that took off, I could see that working. Cause I think you're absolutely right. As a matter of fact, I think I, I I'm, I'm pretty much convinced um, by what you just said um, that um, yes, maybe video gaming is part of the reason, but part of the reason also is that um, um, the youth culture's attitudes and just general optimism versus pessimism has changed their tastes in such a way that that a these old franchises don't really serve them anymore and b it's very challenging to create child appropriate media that does satisfy them because these are dark darkly themed uh, 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 darkly themed uh, programs, and so the idea—if you could do something like it, but have it be the uh, you know the, the the opposite side of it, the, the sunny side of it—would be really interesting. If you could sort of you know make it compelling for for kids, but um, um, needless to say, um, I, I'm assuming I'm hearing and reading that this Corona thing is going to be the final. It's going to kill it, there that we can pretty much kiss goodbye retail in-store comic shops. I mean, that, that, that this is going to go, this is going to be it. Is, are you hearing the same? That is a very distinct fear is a very distinct possibility. Um, there are some structural problems that the industry had to begin with beyond, uh, beyond just something like this there uh, on the distribution side, there was a, a, a monopoly in distribution yeah. and the demographic uh, part that uh, I talked about before that they were still succeeding uh, a little bit more um, with uh, merchandise um, and, and other streams of revenue, but the, the monthly or weekly comic books were still the driving force of income. And uh, once we come back, uh, knock on wood from all of this Corona stuff, there are, there are a number of challenges and, um, some companies are trying to reinvent how distribution is happening. One model that just got announced is this thing that's going to be called Comic Hub that is going to allow people to pre-order and purchase a comic, get it digitally immediately, but have that purchase be associated with a brick-and-mortar retail store. And then once the physical version comes out, you go to the physical store and pick it up. Um and uh, that's been a problem to begin with. Like pre-ordering comics is is quite a hassle, and comic stores have a hard time gauging what the audiences really want to buy. Um, and but right now, you know, all of these problems that were already there are just pushing it into a crisis. And yeah, it's very possible that the model as we know it is going to be completely gone. Yeah, I, I, look at retail more generally. Um, you know. The, the the person the the the, com- the pl- people benefiting from this the most are of course Amazon right I mean um, yeah. I've actually read things where people are saying that they're wondering whether you know bars and restaurants that go out of business are going to get bought up by Amazon and basically they're going to be be no cash ventures where you know you have something like the Prime membership and then you can go in and you can go and get drinks in the bar right I mean I mean I, I'm I'm you know it's a terrifying kind of you know. Um, but I, I've read stories that 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 the distributors and the producers are being really shitty about about all this inventory that comic stores are sitting on that now they literally cannot sell because there are there are shut in orders in their towns and that they're not they're not accepting them back right I mean they're not um, um, and so um, I, I could just see it just I don't see how a comic store could survive more than a month. Yeah, Given that, um, with all that inventory they're sitting on that they've already paid for, yeah. Um, 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 and so, but I guess I, part of what you're saying is that this already was becoming a problem because of digital downloading of the digital d- downloading of comics. There was less and less of a reason to go to a store to begin with. That actually was not as big of an impact as people w- had thought. 
Um, people still prefer the print version. The data seems to suggest we're about, you know, a good eight to 10 years of, of mainstream Marvel and DC comics. So that is not quite the, the, the issue, but the demographics, the inability to, uh, to, to, predict what the audiences do want because a lot of the hot comics week by week are gone, but you know, within days of you getting, getting them. Yeah. So it's hard to attract new readers. Retailers have a hard time risking on those. Interesting. Interesting. All right, Milton. Um, thank you so much. Um, as always, a really enjoyable. Um, and just for the audience to know, we are another thing I've, asked Milton to do, which um, he said he would, I hope he still will, is I do want to talk about where we think the MC Marvel Universe is going to go, the film the film franchise is going to go um, now that we're gearing up, now that we've had Avengers Endgame, we sort of finished this chunk, and now we're moving into the next phase, and um, we now know for what all of the, the sh- movies are going to be in those phases, they've been, they've been laid out. And uh, so I, I'd like to talk to Milton about um, about where we see it going and what we see the dangers or the pitfalls or whatever. Um, maybe we'll also talk about um, you know what what about it was so worked so well and, and things like that. So um, uh, we will have Milton on again. And uh, Milton, stay safe, stay healthy, be careful. You too. And um, I'll speak to you soon. All right. Thanks. All right, man. Take care. <laughs>